Hello, in this video we're going to do even more examples of centripetal force problems to really uh, dig into things. So here we go. Okay, one other example, a uh, very common one of where we see a, uh, something moving in a circle is when a car turns, right? You make a turn in your car. So let's say you're driving, you make a left turn, take a moment, perhaps pause the video and draw what this would look like an overhead view bird's eye view of the car making a left turn remember the centripetal force is not its own force so what force or forces will you draw towards the center of the circle or away from the center of the circle which of those forces contribute to the centripetal acceleration of the car the centripetal force take a moment pause it give it a shot All right, here's the idea. There must be a force towards the center of the circle that makes the car move in a circle. Otherwise, it would skid off into the ditch. That force, that net force, is the force of friction. Friction and static friction, believe it or not, is the net force. Static friction because your tires are not sliding across the asphalt. That would be very bad. They're gripping. They're holding. There's no rubbing between the tires and the road exactly. Part of the friction is also propelling you forward, but the other part of the friction is keeping you from skidding off. The tires are gripping the road, and so as the car wants to move in a straight line like this, the tires grip and grab and push inwards to keep the car where it is and to help it turn towards the center. All right, so it's a static force of friction. That's the only thing keeping you here. The other way to think of it, the time that it's hard to make this turn is on perhaps a very icy day or if you're driving right after it's rained and the roads are very slick, the reason it's much easier to spin out and, and you know, you're trying to turn to the left but the car just skids and slides and goes on a straight line, that's because there's not enough friction. Friction is the thing that makes you turn. The friction between your tires and the road. All right. One other thing you'll see that related to turns is this idea of banked turns. Um, you see them in a few places. Uh, they use in in uh, racing and NASCAR and things like this. You'll see these tracks are made with these uh, extreme banks, these extreme angles that the cars drive along. You also see this though on like entrance and exit ramps getting on the highway. It's very much more mild there, but the big winding loops that you take to get on and get off highways you might notice are very slightly angled. For this same reason, they help contribute to a centripetal force, so it doesn't have to just be friction. So here's the idea. If you're on a ramp, think back to these good old days. If you're on a ramp, you're on an inclined plane, the force of gravity is straight down, but the normal force, remember, it points away from the surface, perpendicular. So the normal force would point like this on a ramp, which would mean there's a component of the normal force pointing towards the center of the circle. And if we do the vector math on that, it would be the normal force times the sine of the angle. This banked turn also is how an airplane turns. Uh, if you've flown on a plane, the main way that a plane turns is it banks you've also probably noticed uh, the plane banks and what happens is there's an upward force on a plane because of uh, the shape of its wings it provides lift that's how the plane flies so as the plane moves forward there's always this force pushing up from the bottom of the plane so if the plane banks and angles that lift force is at an angle now it's not straight up and down and so by the same idea there's some component of the lift that points towards the side points in and that causes the plane to turn in a circle so with banked turns, if you see them, you need to use component vectors like this. Um, for the IB, that'll usually be more conceptual and you kind of set this up. Um, these can be a little time consuming to solve full on, so you usually don't see them in that way. They might be a paper one problem. You have to kind of identify the component vector or something like that. And the last one, let's do a real full on example here that you can solve uh, a classic physics problem the loop the loop um so 
There is a link. Um, I'll link it in the uh, description down below. This is a, a YouTube video where they did it on Fifth Gear. Um, a great little bit where they drive a car through a loop the loop, uh, forty feet high. They it's it's a very uh, wild wild um, experiment that they do. They get a stuntman to really drive a car through this loop the loop, and so you can do the math. And in fact, in the video, you will see them doing the math. Uh, which is pretty wild. Uh, they do the same math we're going to do here to figure out how fast you have to go, how fast you have to hit the bottom of that loop the loop to make sure you make it through. Here's a photo from that video. Um, so this is the moment, the key moment right at the top where things get hairy. You come in a loop the loop down here, the car goes up all around and comes down the other side. This is the moment that matters most imagine if you're the stunt driver so same deal we want to draw the vectors the forces acting on the car while it's at the top of the loop the loop because that's going to be the key we need to know how quickly it's going up at the top so again towards the center of the circle and away from the center of the circle are a few forces there's the force due to gravity which always acts straight down towards the center of the earth the weight of the car is pulling towards the center of the circle. And there's another force in this direction, and it's the normal force. Now take a moment to think about this. Which way should the normal force be? If you are thinking down, you're correct. The normal force is the force from a surface. It's the force from the track. And the track is up here and the car is down here. The track is pushing down on the car. Both the force of gravity and the normal force are pushing down on the car. Has to be because of where the road is. All right, so they both contribute to the centripetal force. Force due to gravity plus the normal force. So what we have to ask is what the minimum speed is to make this happen so we need to think about a cutoff um all right we can substitute some things in we know that the net force is mv squared over r we know the weight is mg and the normal force now the key is i need to think about a, a limit to the situation a cutoff point what is the moment where things get dicey for the stunt driver here and it's about the normal force the thing we want to think about is the normal force if you drive really quickly, you know, M is set, G is set, R is set. So the normal force is a reaction. There's no rule formula for the normal force. It always reacts to everything else going on. You could never just find the normal force without doing everything else first. So in other words, a normal force depends on your speed. If you drove really fast, you could imagine this would be a really big normal force. Right? If you hit this at 100 miles an hour, you're going to be going so fast that by the time you get to the top, there's a ton of, of um, force from the road to keep the car from flying up through it. And it could be so much that you hit a couple Gs and you start dealing with, uh, with issues going in a circle that fast, that tight. But you could also go more slowly and the normal force would be smaller. And more slowly, the normal force would be smaller. Well, the cutoff is going to be if you're at the point where you're just barely making it, that normal force is going to be zero. That would be the cutoff. If you get just to the right velocity where the normal force just barely hits zero or just is slightly greater than zero, that means the road is still touching the car. The car is still touching the track, which is good. If the normal force is zero, the car is essentially off the track. But if the normal force is one newton, you're just barely still touching the track. So that's the cutoff, is zero newtons. That's the minimum speed where you're just about to lose contact with your surface. That one comes up a good bit in a couple different problems. This kind of problem, the hill problem, normal force equals zero is a good cutoff if you're talking about minimum maximum speeds. Uh, so that makes this problem really quite easy then it's just the force of gravity then i want to get find the cutoff is where gravity alone is providing the centripetal force at the very top so r is zero mass cancels out i can solve for v very easily and find that i need to go 
0.7 meters per second or so up here. So that's part A. That's how quickly we need to be going up at the top. Part B asks, what should your speed going in be? The assumption here is we want to make sure you're going as fast as you could possibly need to go because you're going to go up into the air. And so some of that kinetic energy will likely transform into potential energy. So it's likely uh, that you're going to slow down as you go in. So we're assuming that the car is essentially coasting here just to be safe. Um, and as it goes up, it's going to slow down because it's gaining height. So we are going to do for part B, a conservation of energy problem. That would be the best way to do this by far. Because now I know how quickly it's going up here. I know the height and I want to figure out how quickly it comes in. So we're going to revisit conservation of energy here. Uh, see if you can pause it and give it a shot. Set this up as an initial and a final energy thing with kinetics and potentials. See what you come up with. And we're back. Great job. Uh, did you come up with this? This is what you want. Uh, all right, down at the bottom, I have all kinetic energy. It's on the ground, so there's no gravitational potential energy. There's no spring or elastic anything involved, so we don't care about the uh, elastic potential energy. So down here at the beginning in my initial condition, I just have kinetic energy. I'm going to use 1 half mu squared because that'll be my initial speed that I come in with. Then up here at the top, we have both kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. So there we go. I can use this to figure out how quickly I need to go so that all of that kinetic energy turns into potential plus enough kinetic to keep me going in my loop. So this is going to be V final. All right. And conservation of energy being what it is, mass will go away since there's no elastic stuff. And now it's just an algebra problem where I solve for you, substitute my values, and I find I would need to go uh, more than twice as fast coming in, 17.3 meters per second. All right, so there's some conservation of energy at the end there for you, just for funsies. Uh, but that's the idea with circular motion. You're always finding the sum of all of the forces that act towards or away from the center of the circle. Adding those up, setting it equal to mv squared over r, and doing some physics from there. There are even more examples yet to come, but those will be for you to practice and learn through. Um, that should be everything you need to get you going, though, with circular motion problems. So, enjoy.